2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you'll turn there, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 9 and 10 clearly express the theme of the book of 2 Corinthians clearer than any other passage in the whole book. And you note it in that ninth and 10th verse. And it's the title that I had given to this entire series on 2 Corinthians. And I've used it as a paradox. I've called it the strength of weakness. Because Paul tells us here in those verses that the pathway to spiritual strength is through acknowledgement and uh, asking for God's strength. The acknowledgement of our weakness and asking for his strength. God's strength is only ever experienced. I'm talking about his spiritual strength. God's spiritual power is only ever experienced by us when we acknowledge and admit our own weakness and ask him to meet us with his strength in our weakness. So I've titled this 12th chapter, Power to the Powerless. Power to the Powerless. I'm sure the name Hudson Taylor is familiar to most of us here, even though he passed away uh, oh, over 100 years ago. But Hudson Taylor founded a mission board. He didn't mean to. It just turned out that way. It was called the China Inland Mission. Today, I think it's called the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. But anyway, when he founded the China and England uh Inland Mission. He was complimented by one of his friends because of the great success of this mission spiritually, the impact that it had. And he answered his friend, and here's what he said. You know, it seemed to me that God was looking over the whole world to find a man who was weak enough to do his work and when at last he found me, he said, he's weak enough, he'll do. And then he followed up that statement with this. All of God's spiritual giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on God being with them. And that is exactly what Paul is saying here that the only access to God's spiritual power in your life, you need God's power in your life to live and to serve, to be a blessing to others. The only gateway to that is that you admit that in and of yourselves, you're totally incapable. You have that word weakness literally means, get this, strength less. In other words, you have absolutely not one iota, not one ounce of strength. You have absolutely none, nada, zero. But he has infinite power. And that's the way in which we can access God's power in our totally powerless lives. So power to the powerless. Let's have a word of prayer as we look at this passage this morning. Lord, what will we do without your strength? Because we might think that we can accomplish great things for you by depending upon ourselves, but self-effort, you told us, profits nothing. It profits nothing. It accomplishes nothing that you value and that will last for eternity. If we are going to have fruit that remains, it must be fruit that is produced through these branches of our lives by the Spirit of God. We can't make it happen. And so, Lord, help us to always keep in mind that we should continually depend upon the Christ that lives in us to give us the strength to do whatever it is that we're up against, to do whatever it is to live the Christian life successfully.
and to be a blessing and minister to others as well. Lord, it's only you. We thank you that you always meet us when we admit and acknowledge our weakness. And we do that now. I'm too weak to minister your word. I can't accomplish what you want your word to accomplish unless you unite, unless you empower your word. May it go forth today, not in word only, but in the demonstration of the spirit of God's power. I pray in Jesus' name. That is for his glory. Amen. So there are two examples, I think, in this 12th chapter that Paul lays out for us so that we can see how God gives power to the powerless. And the first example is himself. Remember, he's been boasting. He's been boasting in chapter 11, not that he wants to boast in himself or of himself or what he has, because he realizes, you know, anything good that I've accomplished, God's done it in and through me. But he's he's kind of forced into a place where he has to talk about himself because there are these so-called super apostles that are really false apostles that are attacking Paul and thus the ministry that Paul had among the church and the people there in that city of Corinth. And so he's defending the ministries because if his ministry is uh, discredited, guess what? Then the church is nothing either. Then it's good for nothing. So he's, he's forced, they forced his hand to have to give them a list of things And he feels like a fool doing it because he knows it's going to be misunderstood. And so he begins in that first verse of chapter 12. And he says, you know, it's not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory or to boast. I really shouldn't have to do this. But here, I'm going to continue a little bit of this kind of boasting before I'm through here. And so what he does is he talks about, he says, visions and revelations of the Lord. See that in verse 1? He's going to reveal his weakness in his boasting. Remember, upside-down living. He's going to reveal his weakness in his boasting and going to show how God met his weakness with his strength, with God's strength. But here we have in the first, I would say, six verses, really the climax of the boasting list that he began in chapter 11, the chapter before it. And he is, this is really the climax because through what he's going to say in these opening verses in chapter 12, he wants to forever put to silence the boasting of these super apostles, of these false apostles. Look at the vision. The vision that God gave him, the revelations that God gave him, it, he doesn't actually go into it here, but uh, he wants them to realize that these false apostles that have really wowed the Corinthian church, who think that they must be something, they need to reckon with what God did in Paul's life. Really, God honored Paul with some extraordinary spiritual experiences. He calls it in verse 1, first of all, visions and revelations. You know, God gave the apostle Paul some profound understanding of God's redemptive plan. In studying the letters, there's 13 of them, that uh, Paul wrote that are part of the 27 Uh, books in our New Testament, you get a lot of previously unknown revelation that God gave Paul that he reveals to us. They're called mysteries. He unfolds a number of mysteries, and mysteries in Paul's language is the unfolding of previously unknown spiritual truth that God revealed to him personally personally 
so that he could then unfold it to the church, to us. And so he had tremendous visions and revelations. Paul has to, lays out for us the plan for the ages that we would not understand uh, otherwise. And so here is a man that God used in a marvelous way by giving him visions and, re and revelations that were not for him to keep to himself, but for him to share with us so that we have an understanding of, of Bible truth. So we have an understanding of the mind of God that otherwise we would not. And that's not to discount or, uh, or say that Paul's letters are on a plane above all the rest of the New Testament. Not saying that. Please don't misunderstand me. Let me clarify that. But there is something very profound about the visions and revelations that God gave to the Apostle Paul. And then he says in verse 2, <laughs> you want to boast? <laughs> he said, not only did God give me visions and revelations, he took me to heaven. That's what he says. He says, I knew a man, and he's, he's being a, a little coy here because you don't find out who the man was until you get down to uh, verse 7, uh, when he says, and lest I should be exalted of measure through the abundance of the relations, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, lest I should be exalted above measure. And so the man is Paul, but he talks about him in a different tense. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows such a one was caught up into the third heaven. Paul was taken to heaven. This is a, you remember how chapter 11 ended? Where he, he says in chapter 11 that when he was in Damascus, verse 32, the governor under Aratus, the king, kept the city of the Damascus with a garrison desiring to apprehend me. And through a window in the basket, I was let down by the wall and escaped the hands, <laughs> escaped their, uh, his hands. Well, what a contrast this is. A huge contrast between being let down in a basket versus being taken up to heaven. And he says, I have no explanation whether I was transported bodily into heaven or if it was an out-of-the-body experience, I don't know. But what's sufficient for me is just to realize God knows. But Paul was taken up to heaven. And then he says he had a third uh, part of this vision. He said, when I was there, verse 4, when I was caught up into paradise, another word for heaven, the abode of God, by the way, that's the place where Jesus is, where he has gone to prepare a place for us and has promised to return for us. He said, when I was in paradise, I heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So, he had, he had visions, revelations. He was taken to heaven. And thirdly, he overheard divine secrets when he was in heaven that he's not permitted to divulge, that is that, that are incapable for him to properly express. Now, what God wanted us to know that he revealed to Paul is revealed in the New Testament. But there's some stuff that isn't even revealed. This is the privilege that God has given this apostle, Paul. And then picking it up in, uh, uh, let's, let's say, the, uh, the, the fifth verse, basically, he, he goes on to say, you know, <laughs> these experiences are, are, are worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> he said, what I'm going to boast in Verse 5, I'm going to boast in my weakness. See that? I'm going to boast in my infirmities. If I wanted to boast, I'd not be a fool in doing so because 
I'm telling the truth. That's what he's saying in verse six. But he said, uh, I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me the credit beyond what they can see in my life and, and in my message. And so then he says in verse seven, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Here is not just a vision, but now a thorn. And this thorn... While God honored Paul in the vision that he gave him, God humbled Paul in the thorn that he gave him. You know, we comfort ourselves, and rightly so, that when we get to heaven, there'll be no more pain. But the fact of the matter is, because Paul was taken to heaven, he now suffers pain. That's what he's saying. A thorn in the flesh uh, that he got as a result he is now facing great difficulty in his life and ministry. He says, there is something that spiritually frustrates me that leaves me feeling bruised and beaten. By the way, the word buffet in that seventh verse means to beat with the fist. So whatever this thorn is, and it doesn't matter what it is, it could be a physical thing, but it had, I think, spiritual, it had a, a, a spiritual impact upon his life. And he's spiritually frustrated because this, whatever the thorn is, left him feel uh, f- feeling bruised and beaten up. And it awakened him and aroused his flesh, and it brought out the worst in him. You know how when people are in pain, it brings out the worst in them? That's what he's saying here. I don't know what it brought out in him. Maybe it, it because God allowed this in his life, sent this to him. He calls it a gift from God. And at the same time, the same breath, he calls it a messenger of Satan. Isn't that interesting? That God can use Satan to accomplish his purpose in our lives. Who's greater? Who's serving who? And so he says here that uh, whatever this thorn is, it awakens and arouses my flesh and it brings out the worst in me. What is it that, uh, that brings out the worst in you? And what is the worst? Is it your temper? Is it your pride? Is it the lust or the stubbornness of your heart? Paul says, this thorn brought out the worst in me. It aroused, awakened and aroused my flesh. It so spiritually frustrated me, I felt like it was a great hindrance to my ministry. And so what did I do? Verse 8, for this thing, this thorn, this messenger of Satan that leaves me feeling be, uh, beaten and bruised spiritually, he said, I prayed, I besought the Lord thrice three times that it might depart from me. That's what he says. This difficulty was too much for me. I was convinced that it it needed to go. I was convinced that it was hindering my spiritual life and my ministry because it was bringing out the worst in me. And so I asked God to take it from me. But in this difficulty, he made a discovery. And I want you to see what that discovery is. In the um, ninth and 10th verse, especially, he made a discovery. First of all, let me take you back to verse seven. Two times he says in that seventh verse, lest I should be exalted above measure. As a result of the vision that God gave him, the visions, the revelations being taken up to heaven, Hearing, uh, uh, overhearing divine secrets that he couldn't, that he was not permitted to divulge, that would really puff you up. That would make you absurdly uh, conceited. And so he says, as a result, God struck me 
with this thorn in my flesh that is in the area where mm, sin dwells. <laughs> where indwelling sin are, is awakened and aroused in my flesh. And so I wanted it to go. But you know what I discovered? It needed to stay in order to humble me. It was God's tool. It was God's instrument. It was God's gift, he calls it in verse 7. There was given me by God. There was given me by God. It's a gift from him to humble me. God used this spiritual frustration, this painful thing to humble him so that he would not be absurdly conceited. I read that in the victory that a Roman general would have back in that day, they would throw a big ticker tape parade, you might say. They would have a, a, a huge parade, and the Roman general would have a triumphant procession through the city of Rome. And uh, in the chariot beside that triumphant general would be seated a slave. And the slave, it was his job to whisper in the Roman general's ear while they were having this triumphant procession, remember, you too are mortal. Remember, you too are mortal. Because of the danger of arrogance and, uh, and pride. And this thorn is given to Paul so as to whisper in Paul's ear constantly, remember, you're just a man. And so he prays, verse 8 says, he prays long and hard. I think he prayed more than three times. I looked at it, and I think it means I continued to pray over and over again. I prayed long and hard that God would take it from me. And you know what God said? Verse 9 Obviously, God said no. God said no. Now, God heard his prayer, but did not answer Paul's prayer the way that he thought he should. But he's making a discovery. He needs this thorn to humble him. This was God's way of humbling him. And so God says to him, no, I'm not. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect or is complete, will fully equip you in your weakness, is what he's saying. So God says no. And this is the ultimate answer to really the false apostles boasting. Here's a biblical balance. You know, there are preachers and teachers today that teach that it's always God's will to remove pain from your life. Whether it be physical pain or mental anguish or whatever. God didn't see fit to do it here. And I simply say that anyone that is involved in deliverance ministry has to recognize that it's not always God's will to deliver. Sometimes God deliberately gives thorn in the flesh, gives pain in a person's life in order to accomplish the purpose that he has for them. So anyone says that it's always God's will to deliver us from any sort of pain in our life does not understand what the Bible teaches. God said no to this man, to the Apostle Paul. And... Uh, he made that discovery, and it really, one of the most comforting, one of the most reassuring and healing and steadying realizations is that God has a purpose in every pain that he allows into our existence, into our experience. God has a purpose, and human power has to be destroyed. Human weakness has to be revealed in order for God's power to shine through and to, and to be displayed as, uh, as God desires and God intends his glory to shine through us. There has to be the breaking 
of that flesh life, that self life, in order for the Christ life that is in the believer to be able to escape and to be and, and to shine through. We already saw that in I think it was chapter four, where Paul says he's 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 broken, he's crushed, so that the life of Jesus might be manifest through him. It's like the breaking of those clay jars so that the Gideon's uh, army of 300, their light could shine forth from it. And Paul is experiencing, he's making this discovery. He has a thorn in the flesh, but it's in that thorn that he finds grace. And you know, it says, notice it in, in that ninth verse, look for yourselves. It's God says, my grace is sufficient. It doesn't say will be. It says it is. It's not just the promise. It's more than a promise. It's a fact that God's grace is now and always will be sufficient for you. So you should really capitalize that word is. It's present tense. It's a continual tense. God's grace, God's strength is always available in any time of weakness. It's a fact, and uh, sometimes God knows it's unwise and it's unnecessary for us to escape that thorn because through that thorn, God's strength is accessed. God's power is accessed to us in our powerlessness. Got that? That's the discovery he made. Well, as a result of that discovery, everything changes. Paul stops asking, take this from me, and he starts praising. And you have doxology, really, in verses 9 and 10. The second sentence in verse 9, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather boast in my weakness, in my infirmities, that the power of Messiah might rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure. I delight in weakness. I delight in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Here is God's help. The thorn pain is transformed into a song of victory. How? His attitude, his thinking changed. And now he prefers a thorn. He prefers being buffeted. He wants that to remain in his life because he realizes there is something in it that is of greater worth, of greater value than to escape the pain. And that is, he accepts this thorn as God's gift to him because he realizes that this is the only gateway for a human being to experience the Lord's sufficient strength. It's the only way. And so he claims it. <laughs> he takes it. You know, think about this. A beautiful rose. Roses are beautiful and, they're, and they're, their fragrance is just, I mean, almost indescribable. But roses come with thorns, don't they? Why is that? Why such beauty? Why such uh, fragrance with a thorn? It's through the thorn that the beauty and the fragrance of the Christian life is emitted, exudes. So, you know, it, there is a doxology here. And the rest of the chapter really is uh, still illustrating this truth of power to the powerless. It was in the first 10 verses in Paul's life, but in verse 11 down to verse 21, it is through Paul to these people. Not in Paul, but through Paul. You know what he's doing? He's preparing this church for his third visit. He started the church. He left, made another trip back there. Now he's preparing for his third trip. And he says in verse uh, 11, 
I'm become a fool in boasting, but you made me do it. You've compelled me, or I ought to have been commended of you. You should have been writing a letter of, of commendation for me, for in nothing am I behind these super apostles, though, you know what? I'm nothing. <laughs> they think they're something, but I'm nothing, but I'm not behind them. <laughs> Verse 12, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Talking about his ministry there. Verse 13, for what is it uh, wherein you were inferior to other churches except that I myself was not burdensome to you? And he means I did not take a penny from you. I took no finances from you at all. And uh, here's, here's Paul's sarcasm. He says, oh, will you please forgive me that wrong? <laughs> because they were saying, you don't love us. You don't care about us. If you cared about us, then you'd, uh, you'd let us have part in your ministry. And he says, behold, verse 14, this is the third time I'm ready to come to you. And I'm not going to be burdensome to you, meaning financially again. For children ought not to lay up for the uh, uh, for the parents, but the parents for the children. In other words, I'm your spiritual father. I'm the one that ought to be uh, giving to you rather than you giving to me, he says. But then he says in verse 15, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, <laughs> the less you love me, it seems. Now, what's he saying here? He's preparing them for his third visit and he is exposing their weakness. He's exposing their weakness to reveal their necessity for God's strength in their lives, just like he has come to recognize and acknowledge his need for God's strength. And in verses 11 to 13 that we just looked at, he, he's, he's talking about the area of commendation. He says, this church, you should have been boasting about my ministry among you, because when it comes down to it, you owe me your very souls. You wouldn't even be saved if I hadn't uh, come to you the first time. And I've never burdened you financially. And uh, I've had effective ministry among you. Look at you. Your lives have been changed. You should have been writing me letters of commendation for the ministry that I had among you. Don't you realize you're full of yourselves? Don't you realize that really you're weak? You need God's strength. And in verses 14 to 18, he's talking to them about their lack of appreciation for, uh, for him and for his team. Uh, I've already read the 15th verse. He says, you know, as children often fail to appreciate their parents. Do you appreciate your parents? Hey, some of you young people, have you ever sat your parents down now that you're a young adult and, and said, you know what, I, I want to thank you. I want you to know that I appreciate all that you have poured into my life. Well, Paul is saying, I'm your spiritual father. And uh, as kids often to fail, uh, fail to appreciate their parents, he says, so you as a church have been ungrateful for my ministry to you. Because I love the way he says it here uh, in this passage. He says in verse 14, I seek not yours, but you. What he means by that, I'm not ministering for your money. I'm not ministering to you. I'm not serving you for what I can get out of you. The only thing I want out of this is you. And by that, he means I want you to be rightly related to God. Now, that is the true heart of a, of a pastor. That all he really, in the, the bottom line, all he really wants is for people to know and love the Lord. And that's what he's saying here. I'm not trying to take advantage of you in any way, Paul is saying. All I want is you to be rightly related to God. That's the greatest joy of any pastor. And then he shows them not only their weakness in not commending him and not appreciating him, but 
also how they're not consecrated to the Lord. He said in verse 19, if you think that we excuse ourselves unto you, we speak before God in Christ. What we do, we're doing to build you up spiritually. Verse 20, for I fear lest when I come, I'll not find you as I, as I would, and that you shall be found unto you as you would not. In other words, you're going to be, there's going to be sin in the camp. The, the, the church is going to be dealing with problems, and I don't want that when I come. He says, lest there be debates, verse 20, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whispering, swelling, tumults. Verse 21, unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and the fornication, that sexual sin and lasciviousness that's uh, uh, in the same category of uh, sexual sin and also uh, others, things which they've committed. What's he, what's he saying? He's saying, you are so weak because you are bound by sin. And when the church harbors sin, Paul wants them to repent before his visit so that when he comes, he won't have a painful visit. He already had that. He didn't want that to happen again. Well, you know what I really want to end with today is when I was uh, reading earlier in the week in the book of Genesis, I was reading in chapter 32, and I it just struck me. The Lord uh, opened my eyes to see that there is a tremendous parallel between Paul's life and Jake, Jacob's life. In Genesis 32, I don't know if you want to turn there, you can, but in that chapter, beginning in verse 24 to the end of uh, chapter 32, what happens is, you ready for this? God gives Jacob a thorn in the flesh, really. God initiates, he picks a fight with Jacob, he attacks Jacob in Genesis chapter 32. You remember how that came about? It says that uh, Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. He finds out later on that that man is the angel of the Lord, which is a, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord himself. And Jacob, of course, in his raw self-effort, he counters this man who wrestles with him by fighting against God. That's typical of human nature. That's typical of Jacob. He's fighting against God as he wrestles the angel of the Lord. And God knows that proud Jacob will never quit. And so he cripples him. Remember, in verse 25, it says, He prevailed not against him, and so he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. God triumphed over Jacob by putting a thorn in his flesh, by putting his, his hip out of joint. But that triumph over Jacob, listen to me, became the moment of Jacob's victory. That out of joint hip became the moment when Jacob became a victor. That's the way of victory with God. It's to admit your absolute personal weakness and inability. And then to submit in complete dependence to God. And that's what Jacob does in verse 26. He can't wrestle anymore. All he's doing is just holding on with his arms. And he's saying, let me go. The, the angel is saying, let me go. And Jacob says, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. He's just clinging. All I can do. You know, wrestling really involves the legs more than anything. Because your legs are much stronger than your arms. 
but he couldn't use his legs because his hip was out of joint. God crippled him. God triumphed over him because God knew in, in triumphing over him, Jacob would have victory. And that's exactly what happened. He said to him, verse 27, what's your name? Made him admit who he was because that stood for his character. I'm Jacob. I'm the cheater. I'm the schemer. Verse 28, and he said, well, your name is no longer going to be Jacob, but it's going to be Israel. It's going to be Israel. Uh, it's, 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 it's going to be the one who fights and persists with God. And you're going to be the victor. Your name's Israel. For as a, as a prince, you have power with God and with men, and you prevail. So the moment that God triumphs over Jacob in putting his hip out of joint, where he was incapable, where he was totally weak, that became the moment of Jacob's victory. That was his thorn. And as a result, he was marked. He was a marked man. It says uh, in the closing verses, verse 30, Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. Means in Hebrew, the face of God. He called it Peniel. For I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him and he halted upon his thigh. He, he, he limped. He was a cripple from the rest of his life. Jacob called the place the face of God, and he's marked for life with a God limp. Peniel, the place of unparalleled humility, the place where Jacob met with God and his pride was crippled. Peniel is meeting with God, coming into the presence of God, and, and it is a pride crippling experience. It's a place where God exposes our utter human weakness. And it's the only way that we'll ever experience and obtain God's strength. So I should ask you, have you ever had a penial moment? You know, maybe I would put it this way. Every lost sinner in order to enter into salvation, has to have a penial moment where they have a meeting with God and they recognize, I am totally unable to save myself. I have no ability. I'm, I'm completely spiritually bankrupt, and I need God and his power and his redemption. So if you are a believer, You've had a penial moment when you came to Christ and received him as your Savior because you admitted you had no strength of your own to do it, to save yourself. But as believers, we need constant penial moments. When we have face-to-face -face meetings with God, when we get into the presence of God, and I wonder if you would be willing, and if you have done this, or if you haven't, would you be willing to, to ask God for a penial moment, even though it may mean that you come out of it crippled, even though it may mean that you come out of it with a thorn in your flesh, because God wants to give you the ability to tap his power, his strength, because you have none of your own and you need his power, his strength in your life in order to live the Christian life, in order to, to minister to other people and be a blessing in your home and outside of your home, wherever it might be. You need a penial moment, a face-to-face -face with God on a regular basis. It may include, I guarantee it will include, it will include some type of a thorn, it may not be a physical pain, but it, he will always prune away the self-life, right? He's the true vine, Jesus. His father is the 
is the vine keeper, the husbandman. And every branch, you're the branch if you're a believer, that bears fruit, he purges it, he prunes it, he cuts away the self-life more and more that it may bring forth more fruit. We always want those thorns to, I mean, if you have, if you have a uh, vase of roses, you know, if you want to pick them up, you, you want to knock the thorns off first, right? We always want the thorns knocked off of our life, but they serve a purpose on a rose and they serve a purpose in the believing life. They're God's means of accessing. His power. There's no other way to access the power of God than through thorns in our lives. The pain of some sort that God brings into our life to trim the self-life so that we might be filled with God's blessing and God's strength.